Good afternoon, and welcome to an informative presentation sponsored by the American Experience Pyramid and Take Charge. It's really a test of testimony to see so many came out today with the weather condition as is. We're glad to have you and welcome for coming. My name is Eric Hines and I'm an ambassador for Take Charge. Take Charge is a nonprofit organization established to advocate, promote, and re-energize community engagement around faith, family, and education. It is my honor to introduce today's speaker, Mr. Winford Riley. Mr. Riley is an associate professor of political science at Kentucky State University and the author of several books. Taboo, 10 Facts You Can't Talk About, Hate Crime Hoax, and The $50 Million Question. Mr. Riley has published pieces in Academic Question, Commentary, Quillette, and a number of other journals and magazines. His research interests include international relations, the prevention of war, commentary American race relations, and the use of modern quantitative method to test sacred cow theories such as the existence of widespread white privilege. Of work, he enjoys dogs, archery, basketball, Asian cooking, and beer. <laughs> Mr. Riley has described himself as the greatest mind of a generation. <laughs> Without further ado, Let's extend a warm Minnesota welcome to Mr. Winford Riley. Yeah, great to be here. How are you guys? Yeah. All right. Um, by the way, the end of the bio that um, my skilled interlocutor there just read was a joke. Um, when my books reached quote unquote bestseller status, I got to upload a full bio to Amazon and they sent me all these notes about how technical they were, how they'd be watching everything, they wouldn't allow any insults or jokes, and I thought this was just BS given the number of books on Amazon. So the ending line of my Amazon bio is that I've been described as the greatest writer and thinker in the world by myself. And I just sent it to them because I assumed they'd upload it with no problems, which they did. Um, I've later made changes to it, like changing my actual name until my publisher told me to stop doing that. So bi big data is a lot dumber than we tend to think. Uh, the feds may be watching you, but it's just the IP address for your cell phone company. Anyway, that is a technical point that I bring up in my cybersecurity class, but here today we're, uh, we're gonna be focusing on some of my other material. I'm uh, obviously Will Riley. I'm an associate professor of politics at Kentucky State University, and I'm the author by now of several books, uh, Hate Crime Hoax, Taboo, and The $50 Million Question, along with a good chunk of another nail biter called Red, White, and Black from the 1776 Unites Initiative. And as a Midwesterner, I'm actually very familiar with the center. I'm glad to get a speaking invite from you guys. Uh, and I genuinely look forward to signing books, uh, exchanging cards, and so forth after my, uh, my 50 minutes of fame are up here today. Uh, I'll be in the room until something like 1.30, 1.45. I see the books outside on a table, so glad, glad some of you bought them and decided to engage with that. Um, but today, I'll be talking about something that's actually pretty important, seriously, for a heartland business and professional audience to understand, which is why the kind of approved narrative that we're transmitted so often from the mainstream media, the softer social sciences, uh, the NGOs, the charitable sector, even representatives of the government in sectors like public health so often seems to completely collapse. And I think my first book actually is a pretty good starting point for that. So as I said, I wrote Hate Crime Hoax, which came out in 2019 with Regnery Publishing. And the theme of that book is very, very simple. Uh, many 
I, I think you might know what it is. Many, uh, probably most, of the very high profile incidents of racial crime and racial conflict that polarized the country during the past decade or so, and this is true from the mostly Caucasian on alt-right on over to the quote unquote SJW college minority left, uh, turned out to be fakes on the part of the alleged victim or simply to have never happened at all. Um, this is something that amazed me when I found it out to, to the point where I decided to write the book, to produce the text. And the archetypal example, of course, is the Jussie Smollett case, which was so frankly funny that it's worth reiterating here in a little bit of depth. Um, a fairly well-known actor claimed that he was attacked in Center City, Chicago, on the coldest day of the year by two conservative white goons who recognized him from the hip hop TV show Empire, which is about gay rappers. Um, they told him that Chicago was MAGA country um, and they managed to pour warm bleach on him. None of this would be funny at all were it true, but pour warm bleach on him and toss a knotted rope noose around his neck before he bravely fought both of them off. Uh, two big guys. Um, throughout all of this, according to Smollett, who weighs about 147 pounds, he never dropped his tuna salad Subway sandwich. <laughs> the sandwich was with him, the police reported this, the sandwich was with him when they came to interview him back in his penthouse <laughs> condo apartment. Now, of course, as everybody's non-woke friends just might have predicted on the golf course or the basketball court or back at the office, this all turned out to be complete BS. Um, Chicago is not, in fact, MAGA country. I used to live in the Streeterville Young Professional neighborhood, which went, if I recall correctly, 92% for Hillary Clinton. And so it eventually turned out that uh, Jussie, the man uh, described by Dave Chappelle as the lunatic Frenchman Juicy Smollier, um, <laughs> basically just paid two buddies from the gym to stage a pretend assault. Um, they were Nigerian, as I recall, <laughs> which is kind of questionable because the entire, and I, again, you don't want to get too much into humor, but the entire assumption here is that these were white criminals. Um, odd choice there. But while this is entertaining in one sense, what's not humorous at all is that this really has happened over and over again. Um, and the book describes these cases. I mean, you had Yasmin Saweed and the torn hijab, this sort of sexually charged case of racial violence on the New York 6 train. You had uh, Georgia Congresswoman Erica Thomas, who claimed an assault in an upper end uh, grocery store. She was brutally told to go back home, quote unquote, by a white man. Uh, this guy, by the way, turned out to be a Cuban-American Democrat who interrupted her own press conference to say that this had never happened. But I mean, you had the Air Force Academy situation where a general had to come to campus and speak out against what seemed to be a, a series of conflicts between black and white cadets. Um, you had the horrible Nikki Jolly house fire where uh, a transgender man's house in Michigan burnt down, killing a slew of purebred dogs. Uh, Duke lacrosse just a decade or so back, a whole string of alleged atrocities at the University of Missouri, uh, rival Ang Shin of my own University of Illinois, etc. And these are among the close to 400 cases that are discussed, at least in passing, in hoax. Uh, all or almost all of them were major national stories. A cutoff just for inclusion in the book, actually, was being reported on in a national or in a major regional outlet. Um, and obviously, uh, bearing the little bit, but all of these turned out to be fakes. All of these, these turned out to be hoaxes. We had a case of this in Kentucky, where I currently live. I live in uh, Metro Louisville. Um, I dislike exaggeration, and this is probably more of a hate incident hoax than a hate crime hoax. But if you remember this, the uh, Covington Catholic boys incident took place about 40 miles from where I live. And this, of course, was the claim that a group of prep school athletes had attacked a Native American Indian elder while they were on a school trip to DC, uh, surrounding him, shoving him, worst of all, grinning at him. Um, but 
threatening to take his sacred rain drum away, chanting build the wall, which would be a damn ironic thing to say to an Indian. Um, and almost literally, the entire media went hysterical and ran with this story. Uh, it had all the elements that are sought, you know, ethnic conflict, uh, chance perhaps to harass the local rich, um, religion played a role. These kids were originally there at the March for Life. But uh, the Washington Post ran a couple of page two stories. Uh, CNN and MSNBC all covered this scuffle story, yammering on about what it meant about hidden racism in the USA. Uh, one columnist famously called one of the kids who was about 15 punchable. Uh, so on down the lineup, no comment on that, but still wildly inappropriate from one of the papers of record. Uh, and this literally led two or three major daily news cycles. And in my opinion, that would be remarkable. That would be insane under any circumstances. But it inevitably turned out that the whole thing was a fake. Um, the Covington kids had been involved in some very mild back and forth with a group of the quote unquote black Hebrew Israelites that you can find if you've ever been to downtown DC. And the Indian guy had apparently walked over to them and started chanting in their faces and beating the drum. Um, no one, it turns out, was hurt. No one said anything racist. After a brief investigation, no charges were filed. And I will say that anyone working for any media outlet could have found this out really at any point. Uh, multiple people thought that the video, even of what did happen, was pretty entertaining. And it was live on the internet before the first mainstream media story ran. Uh, partly because of that, the Covington Catholic boys ended up suing uh, some of the players involved, like the Washington Post and CNN. And from what I understand, as someone in the area, they did not receive a small amount of money from this. So, yeah, that's my attitude too, good for the kids. Um, but we've actually, we've seen the same thing here in Minnesota. Um, some of your cases actually made my book. Uh, at least one, uh, my guess would be all, unless you had multiple racists that wrote in the exact same style, but at least the primary one of the racist notes that prompted uh, massive student protests at uh, St. Olaf, if I have that correct, uh, was exposed since 2017 as a proven hoax. Um, there was a similar case at Pleasant Little Carleton College, as I recall. So, as you've probably noticed, there's the same pattern in every one of these situations. Uh, you have utter hysteria up front, and again, the Smollett and Covington and Duke Lacrosse and Air Force cases all led the national news media. These weren't local stories. These weren't Tan's gentle college fix kind of articles. Um, two, you have the linking of the situation, two guys get in a fight in many cases, to this sort of preset narrative about a broader national problem. And then you have total collapse, which is often managed, if you will, and kept as low key as possible. Um, what I notice, and what I'm gonna talk about today beyond hate crimes, is that this is part of a broader pattern in society. Uh, as a sort of normal, maybe upper middle class citizen today, you're exposed to a ton of storylines from mainstream media and academia that cause real and sincere panic, but that turn out not to be true whenever anyone investigates at all. Um, so not to plug too blatantly, but my second book, Taboo, looks at this broader problem but for that one, I looked at the claims that people were making in the context of some of the most widely reported narratives of what by this time would be 2019, 2020, uh, from the Black Lives Matter movement on to the quote unquote dissident right or alt-right. And I used kind of standard quantitative methods to check out how true they were, these things that were being repeated in very major venues, newspapers and academic journals and television news magazines. And even I was surprised. So the first, and I'll go through some of these on left and right. I obviously lean to the center right myself, so I'm gonna make fun of quote unquote social justice more. Um, hopefully you guys are comfortable with that. But, all right, fair enough. But I mean, this is a, a phenomenon of sensationalist media that's actually pretty troubling. But the first chapter of my book looks at the Black Lives Matter movement. And this has faded a bit, but it's important to remember what some of the claims were, especially here in Minneapolis. Um, 
Chernobyko at one point went on primetime Fox News and said that an innocent, unarmed black man is quote unquote murdered by the police almost every day. Uh, ben Crump, who I've sparred with a few times online, well-known attorney, put the figure much higher. He recently wrote a best-selling book, it's actually a few spots ahead of mine, called Open Season, The Legalized Genocide of Colored People. So this, this is on Amazon right now. The argument is that obviously the focus of the book is on the USA of today. So the argument is that this, this genocide is ongoing. Uh, and a lot of people believed this stuff. Uh, Americans in general tend to be pretty sincere, pretty good faith people in my opinion. And people assumed that they were being told the truth by leaders in media and academic and political roles. So the Black Lives Matter organizations, the primary 30 or 40 under the BLM GNF umbrella, were given something like $11 billion in 2020, according to The Economist. You can, that's their estimate, you can check out their figures, but if you just Google BLM $10.6 billion, you'll find the original Economist article. Um, a recent, uh, I, I will note, no one really seems to know what's happened to those funds, but that's a different speech for a different day. Um, but a recent poll from the Skeptic Research Center found that the average liberal American still believes that between 1,000 and 10,000 unarmed black men are killed every year by the police. So as it turns out, that's all nonsense. When I and others, like the Manhattan Institute's Heather McDonald and Harvard's Roland Fryer started looking, it turned out that the total annual number of people shot by the police in the USA is under 1,000. Um, in a typical year, about 75% of these cases involve white or Hispanic victims and just aren't reported on. They never make the news. I'm not gonna ask you guys to do a lot of thinking exercises while I'm up here talking, but in your own mind, ask yourself if you could name two white or Latino victims of police violence. Uh, and most of those guys, across all racial lines, most of the thousand people are people that happen to be attacking the officer. The total number of unarmed people shot every year is about 100. The total number of unarmed black men shot last year was 18. It's worth repeating that number, 18. So you can go to the website for the Washington Post, which is not too far to the right of Lenin, and confirm that if you want to, but I mean, this is after about four years of serious research into the narrative. And again, people, whether coming from my perspective or coming from the political left, took the original narrative seriously. After four or five years of research, what serious people found out is that the number wasn't 10,000, it was 10. Uh, that's pretty much it. That's the movement. Um, we were just to some extent being shown literally every single one of the cases that involved violent conflict between young black men and the police by national media. And when people started pointing that out, this isn't the tip of an iceberg, this is all of the cases that exist, the movement basically collapsed. Um, the second chapter of Taboo moves on from that a bit to look at the broader idea that there's a ton of interracial conflict and interracial crime in the USA in the first place with, again, quote unquote, the white man initiating most of it. And this was, again, sort of a top 10 Google search focus of the media for the past five years or so. We probably all remember stories about Barbecue Becky and Pool Patrol Paula and people brawling across ethnic lines over their dogs in Central Park. Um, but more seriously, Stop Asian Hate was the leading hashtag on Twitter for multiple, multiple weeks last year, following a series of genuinely violent attacks on Asian American fellow citizens. But again, the facts turned out not to fit the narrative at all. First of all, I will note, uh, as it happens, interracial crime of any kind is extremely rare. Uh, tough white and black guys almost never choose to attack one another. Um, the person most likely to kill you is your ex-wife. <laughs> now, whenever I say that, it's treated as a humor line. It's not. There's actually, by the way, I will say, there's an interesting male-female difference here. Uh, a psychologist, something like that, a social worker in the crowd might correct me, but as I understand, it's your ex-wife or your current husband, which says something interesting about male-female differences, in my opinion. Men, stupid, brutish in the moment, might suspect you of cheating. 
women capable of plotting in long-term anger. <laughs> so, especially for the gentlemen, respect that. Um, if I knew the full verse of Diddlier Than the Male from Kipling, I would quote it, but I don't. So, but I mean, at any rate, that, is, that, that sort of thing, eating too much bacon, enjoying your cigars, is what's actually going to kill you. Um, according to the government agency, the Bureau of Justice Statistics, the BJS, um, old school interracial crime, which I would think of as violent crimes involving, say, blacks and whites and Asians, makes up about 3% of crime. Um, there are about 600,000 crimes that fit that bill in a representative year, like 2018. This makes the point, by the way, that in a country of 350 million people, there's a whole lot of everything. So if you go looking for clips of police brutality or domestic violence or whites committing crimes or blacks committing crimes, or almost anything else, you'll find them. You can go on the internet and search literally anything, including the most bizarre and troubling sorts of pornography, I've been told, and discover this. So perhaps don't. Uh, look at the broader numbers. But at any rate, in the representative year of 2018, you had 600,000 of these brutal interracial crimes, whether with a white perp and a black victim, or, white, or a black perp, white victim. But that was out of 20 million total crimes. So again, those, those are the actual numbers. Now, this next point isn't my focus as a black dude, but honesty compels me to note that these crimes are also about 80% black on white. So, it's remarkably dishonest to focus on this very fringe issue at all, but then criticize only the white guys. I mean, at this point, we're talking about 15% of 3% of crime, or whatever that total would be. And that's what people mean by, it seems like there's an agenda out there. It seems like we're being told certain things. Maybe these aren't the biggest stories in the country. Very, very often that's the case. Um, that's actually what started to come out with the Stop Asian Hate movement, by the way, which I think from sort of my consulting perspective was really embarrassing enough to kind of stop this narrative. The, the we're having a race war narrative really ended in terms of Google Alexa search results late 2020, early 2021. Uh, when people, including me for Commentary Magazine, uh, started digging into the worst 100 or so Asian attack cases, nobody turned out to be a quote unquote white supremacist. Um, about 50% of the perps turned out to be black. The rest were white or Latin, but were just regular urban criminals, uh, bikers, homeless people, and so on down the line. Even the uh, Asian spa shooter turned out to be essentially someone with a sexual or mental health problem rather than a racist. Uh, his issue with Asian Americans was that he thought that specifically sex workers at massage parlors we're trying to seduce him away from Jesus. Um, it's a quote from the deposition. I imagine that could be a tough problem for a Christian man struggling with this issue. But at any rate, he obviously did an unforgivable thing. He also shot several Asian Ameri or non-Asian American people on that unfortunate day. But again, when all of this started to emerge, the real issue of mental health problems for males, the diversity of the people involved, um, these storylines just sort of faded away. They vanished. The information curation began anew. So I haven't seen Stop Asian Hate on a front page or in the Twitter trends bar lately. Um, I haven't really seen a good fake racial incident since Central Park Dog Gate Part 2. Um, but these examples of narrative collapse could go on for some time. Um, I, I don't necessarily think you guys want to hear um, another 45 minutes of statistics, so I'll give one or two more and then walk gracefully to this side of the stage. But the middle chapters of the book deal with the broader idea of systemic racism. Uh, simply put, this is the idea that any sort of gap in performance between two groups has to be due to racism or to some kind of other prejudice. Um, official MacArthur genius, Ibram Kendi, has famously argued that only two options really even exist when you see gaps in terms of, for example, test scores between two groups in America. Um, explanation A would be racism. There's a bias against the lower scoring group. And explanation B would be some kind of long lasting, probably genetic inferiority on the part of one of the groups. Again, this isn't my argument, but it's an extremely common one. 
And again, we've recently seen this claim about a deep-seated systemic bias made across major media as re-everything from COVID-19 masking policy to the hiring of NFL coaches. Um, all of these things are racist, are prejudiced. The classic example, though, I will say is income. So black men earn about 75% of what white men do. And this is just universally attributed to racism. Latino men, I will note, earn uh, a bit less still. But once again, it turns out that the basic facts that are starting to be presented don't really support this narrative, don't really support this storyline. Um, economists like Tom Sowell and June O'Neill have famously pointed out for quite a while, in fact, in the academic sort of non-popular press, that adjusting for just a few things causes almost all, closes almost all racial and regional gaps in performance. One is just age. Uh, this is probably the most mundane thing I regularly say. Um, not really all that controversial. The figures sound kind of unbelievable. But the most common age for a white guy, what's called the modal average, is 58. The most common age for a black man is 27. So not mentioning this, when you're talking about anything from wealth and income on the right to crime, or wealth and income on the left, I guess, to crime statistics on the right, is just totally dishonest. Um, another is region. So more black people, and certainly I would imagine more Hispanic Americans, live in the South and the Southwest, where wages are just lower for everyone. Another one is test scores. We don't need some kind of weird genetic explanation to just honestly note that Asians probably study more than Southern white or black kids do. Um, I will also note that you can, you can flip the script on this sort of thing in a variety of ways. There's one current active Asian American NBA player. Shout to Jeremy Lin. So people do seem to specialize in different things at different times. But again, adjusting for these things, some of which sure may have their roots in past racism, closes all of the gaps. And again, you're starting to see the pattern, you're starting to see the trend, where more and more smart people are noticing this. And more and more smart people are saying openly that a lot of the specific examples that are being used don't make a ton of sense. Um, for example, I just, I looked this morning and the quote unquote racist NFL is 65% non-white. So that's one of those, and then there's that uh, points. Now that's players, but you are starting to see a similar pattern among younger coaches, coordinators as people rise. Uh, the guy who sued the league, Flores, and we'll see what happens, we'll see whether he does find some residual bias, but his case has been notably weakened by the fact that he was replaced by a black coach. Um, counting the ex-hid man for my own Chicago Bears, uh, Big Lovey Smith, it looks like something like a third of all the off-season hires were black coaches. So we may be about to see another narrative just quickly collapse and be shoved off the screen. So the question is why this keeps happening. I think by this point, most people, at least most sort of business people on the right and the center right, have come to assume that this isn't a coincidence. This seems to occur over and over and over again, and they're predictable patterns. Uh, the mainstream media starts talking about how black lives matter and about the homeless on the streets about nine months before every election, for example. Couple pretty famous academic papers on this. So why does this keep occurring? I think that there are a couple of broad traits or a couple problems. One is sensationalism in our society in general. And this is actually, not to get preachy, but this is a big problem really across party lines, really whatever you believe. Everyone's wired in to media, to social media combined eight or nine hours a day. So people feel spikes of panic based not on things that are going on in their own life or anywhere around them, but on things that are going on somewhere else in the world, maybe. And th this gets into some of the, uh, the more right-wing issues, actually. The first thing I ever recall thinking of in this way was young child kidnapping. When I was 18, 19 in college and first started sort of dating people with jobs, this was... But this was kind of the Amber Alert era, like young middle class women who might have one kid were walking around with him on a leash. And every couple of days there was another televised story about a young, beautiful, blonde or African American child being snatched off the porch by the worst sort of pervert. And this went on for a while. I mean, we got Amber's Law. Uh, during this, uh, a sociologist named Barry Glasner actually looked at how many kids are kidnapped for real, like taken for longer than a week, 
well, yeah, not by their father, desperate to see them again, but taken for longer than a week by a non-family member and abused. And it turns out the actual number is about 90 a year. And I, I would suspect this is very common. I would suspect this underlies almost all of these panics. Uh, I mentioned this to my current fiance, and her comment, and she herself is a youngish, upper middle class woman who believed this at one point, but her comment was, well, now that I think about it, that seems really unlikely. How would you go into an armed Kentucky neighborhood like our own and just walk out carrying a kid? And it's one of those valid questions that's never asked. Are you going to break into someone's house? If they're at the park, are they alone? Are you simply going to take the kid and leave with no one noticing? Questions remain, terrible thing does happen, but the figure there, uh, 90 per year. I would say, I would argue that we've even seen similar things with the governmental and media response to COVID-19. Um, th this is not my focus area. I'm not going to talk about it very much. Again, this is a bipartisan problem. But do any, well, I'll a ask and answer the question. The COVID-19 lockdowns began when a guy named Neil Ferguson in the UK published a paper saying that in, if I recall correctly, his best case scenario, something like 2 million people would die from COVID-19 in the USA. Another 550,000 in Britain. Some of you may recall this. Um, if, unless we immediately shut down, quarantine, so on down the line, wouldn't be enough. It turned out, uh, this was followed immediately by another guy, Pueo, uh, wrote a piece called The Hammer and the Dance, who said that the total would be closer to 10 million. And this was immediately boosted by mainstream media outlets. It was, in my opinion, the direct causal reason for lockdowns. It also turned out to be totally wrong. And even now, after two years of COVID panic, I don't think most people know the actual facts around the disease. COVID is obviously real and very deadly. But for example, the average age in my home state of someone to die from COVID-19 is 81. The countries that did the best were those that immediately, for example, got nursing home workers working in shifts that protected seniors. Um, the actual, the IFR, quote unquote, the fatality rate for COVID-19 per the CDC last July turned out to be about 0.26%, not 1%, 2%, the other things that led to lockdown. Uh, and I think now, again, people are starting as more people on the left in big cities started getting COVID, I think that people are pulling back a little from the original narrative. So you're now seeing headlines like the DC examiner's recent Sweden was right. But fear created by this kind of sensationalist climate is an aspect of modern life that most people don't even notice. We spend a great deal of time very afraid of problems that aren't in fact significant threats to us and may not even exist. Um, but I also think, speaking to this audience, we have to acknowledge the reality of bias. Why do all of these narratives, or most of these narratives coming from, again, CNN and MSNBC and The Times and The Post seem to collapse in one direction? I think an obvious answer is that most of the people working for these outlets believe one set of things. Uh, there was a famous general survey done by Pew, the research organization in 2004, that found that 7% of national mainstream media journalists identify as conservatives or libertarians. So seven. The other 93% were leftist liberals or left-leaning moderates. And this keeps coming out. Academia actually is a bit worse in this direction. Um, Econ Live recently looked at what percentage of professors were actually communists by asking the question, do you currently identify as a Marxist or a communist? It was pretty unambiguous. Uh, in the social sciences, at least 18% said yes. If I recall, by the way, there's a, I won't steal my friend Bonnie Snyder's speech, but I have a good friend who talks about the book she was assigned in college and how often each one was assigned. And she has a PowerPoint and she clicks on it and it's like one assignment's the Bible, two assignments, the collected works of Shakespeare, 12 assignments, the Communist Manifesto, which is also what you'd see in most political science programs. But at any rate, I mean, in academia, 18% Marxist. As I recall, the same survey found that another 21% of academics identify as radicals. Another 24% beyond that identify as activists, people that want to dramatically change this society. Now, having been taught by these people, my math may be a little off, but that's, a, that's around 60% overall in sort of that, that fringe block. Um, my favorite finding of all time of this kind, and again, I think things should be 50-50. I don't think I or we should entirely dominate. But in sociology, last they checked, 0% uh, of the professors identify as Republican. 
No, it was, uh, seriously, this was on my Twitter, if any of you are interested, the original source, the journal article, but zero. Now, to be fair, only 82% or something identified as Democrats. So you also had some Greens. I mean, you, you had some American communists. You had some diversity. But the Republican figure was zero. Um, I actually asked today who's the best known conservative sociologist in the country, and I got nothing but trolls from left-wing debating opponents until I took it down. There is no answer to the question. There isn't one. But I mean, so you see the combination of sensationalism, one, with, I also will add, and this is nonpartisan as well, a control of kind of our information disseminating infrastructure by a tiny number of people, um, upper middle class, very urban, coastal in most cases, maybe Great Lakes for a few, mostly liberal, mostly Caucasian, all that doesn't really matter, but people with very similar ideas, and then you add in the variable of almost unified political belief, it's not good. But I think that many of the people producing today's content believe in the three core claims of what in both of my books I've labeled the continuing oppression narrative, which is, I, I guess claim one would be that the systems of modern society are set up to oppress. Uh, they don't do so incidentally. This comes from a famous quote from the critical theorist Richard Delgado that racism is every day, everywhere, that's the goal. Many people believe this. The purpose of the criminal justice system, for example, would be oppressing blacks or young men, not incarcerating rapists and domestic batterers. So that, that's point one. Uh, point two would be something we've already discussed, which is that gaps in performance show this discrimination. They're evidence of oppression. And point three would be that the solution to this is equity which you may have heard mentioned in the press from time to time, that's very different from the concept of equality. Equality means roughly an equal chance, an equal starting line. We don't, we don't quite have that, but we come pretty close. Equity means proportional representation among all groups regardless of performance. So, I mean, uh, Dr. Kendi mentioned earlier once a federal department of anti-racism that would observe businesses and would correct any imbalance in the workforce of any American corporation, for example. So I think a lot of people believe this sort of core starting premise. Uh, society set up to oppress, disparities equal discrimination, the solution's equity. And from that, along with the desire for sensationalism, come the, the narratives that we see, the Black Lives Matter storyline, the race war storyline, the systemic abuse storyline, so on down the line. But I think that the problem with this, to quote Charles Darwin, is that it's wrong. A lot of it is almost stupidly incoherent. And I think some of the points made above, just adjusting for how old people are removes half this gap, makes that fairly clear. So what do, there's the old line in any sort of business speaking, always close with a solution. So what should you do about this? Um, I think that there are a couple of responses. First, when you consume the content from the larger society around you, be aware of what it's very likely to be, I think. Um, many descriptions in the mainstream press of, for example, expertise or the consensus of the experts are to exactly the things that I've been talking about so far. The consensus that there is systemic racism. Um, the expert opinion that COVID lockdowns are mandatory, so on down the line. You very often might, if you do a bit of deep digging, find that the expert being referred to is Dr. Kendi himself or the 1619 Project, which recently appeared in a series of editions of the New York Times Magazine, so on down the line. Uh, point one, be aware. Point two, do your own research. I will note that there is a growing network of alternative uh, sources providing information. So I'm a member, for example, of FAIR, the Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism. Yeah, doing great work, I think. I was, I was recently invited to the, uh, the or first meeting of the Minnesota chapter. I believe, so looks like some of you guys are in attendance. Glad to have you here. Uh, FAIR, obviously, if you simply Google Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism, you'll find all of our content. I'm a member of 1776 Unites, which is sort of the black business and social science community's response to 1619, and a range of things, including an educational curriculum that's actually been downloaded about four times as often as theirs, can be found at our website, it's www.1776unites.com. But 
I think there's a final piece of advice in addition to these sort of basic comments like do your research, um, and be aware of what your opponents are saying. Also recall that common damn sense is underrated and that logic, <laughs> logic is not a discipline specific skill. So if you in your personal life have a ton of black and white and Latino buddies, you probably aren't a racist. A country where the richest groups are all Asian is probably not white supremacist. Um, keeping it PG for this audience, I think there are many interesting ways to tell men and women apart. As re a new paradigm that seems to be arising, the new narrative that may be coming from the sidelines to challenge the ovary havers in the audience, as I believe the term is. But I think the reality is the reality is that the emperor has no clothes. I actually am going to close by asking you guys to do one kind of corny thing. Raise your hand if you'd feel comfortable saying most of what I just did in an ordinary workplace. Raise your hand if you feel totally comfortable speaking all the time. Oh, more people than I thought, but okay, totally comfortable speaking all the time. We're down to like one or two. Raise your hand if you believe most of it. Stand up if you raised your hand. All right, the large majority of people know the truth. Now it's a matter of saying it and not pretending you believe BS and nonsense. Sit back down, go forth and do good. First question I've got is you are an academic, a college professor, and that has turned in, as you, as you said, to a, to a pretty strange world. How do you navigate that? Have you had issues there? Well, I think it helps that I was a pretty successful investor before I got into academia. So I'm not as worried about being fired. Um, I mean, all banter aside, I, I have tenure, which helps. But I also will say that I think that wokeness is a very concentrated phenomenon in the extreme sense. I mean, I teach at a historically black college in Kentucky, and I think that the environment I experience is pretty normal. And it'd probably be pretty similar to what I'd experience at a number of other institutions, most of the A&Ms, certainly military schools, community colleges, anything like that. So I think if I taught at the Claremont Colleges in California or something like that, or at Brown in the Ivy League, there might be a little more of an issue. But as it is, I don't, I don't really see that much of one on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, hopefully that's wood. You know, <laughs> you never know. That could change. But I, I actually haven't had a dramatically bad or negative experience, and I obviously, obviously hope that continues. You mentioned the the rate uh, the, uh, the the race hate hoax at St. Olaf College here in Minnesota, where the, there were these notes left around the campus, yeah, yeah. and then it turned out that this this black student girl had had written them. It, my daughter was a student at St. Olaf at the time. Later, the president of the Minnesota College Republicans, and so she lived okay. through that. But there's a curious aspect of it because when the, when this when when it first gets reported, we see this I think over and over when it's first reported. The university administration comes down like a ton of bricks. This is terrible. We have racism here. <laughs> we have to have like stop, suspend classes. We have to have workshops on, on anti-racism, et cetera. And, and then when a, a few weeks later, it turns out the whole thing was a, was a fake, instead of saying, sorry, you know, forget Very all that, it, it's, it's more along the lines of, well, it's still an important lesson or, or, or something. What, what's the mentality behind that? Uh, many such cases, as the internet joke goes. Yeah, that's, that's extremely common. Very often what you see in these cases is that the first uh, incident, the incident that actually turns out to be a hoax, is treated as evidence of, you know, even here at beautiful St. Olaf, we face the problem of, systemic, international, post-colonial, cis-heterosexist, et cetera, racism. And then when this inevitably collapses, the joke I make in hoax is that the collapse is reported on page 27 of kind of the leisure and pet cat section of the local <laughs> paper. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. The college paper, I actually couldn't find the follow-up. They apparently didn't cover it. Um, the, the reality is that there are a lot of reasons from legitimate concerns for student mental health to the fact that the narrative's collapsing that make following up embarrassing, so people don't necessarily follow up. Um, I, I don't really know what you can say about that, but that's, that's extraordinarily common, that this is, there, most of the attention is paid up front. The problem with that, of course, is that many people don't notice how many of these stories end up collapsing. Last question I want to ask you, Wilfred, is about social media. You are a powerful presence on Twitter, uh, kind of an artist of the, uh, of the forum. 
And well, thank uh, you guys. talk about that a little bit. How do you use social media and how do you maintain your mental health while you're doing it? Um, well, one of the, there's a very famous comment about cyberbullying actually from a rapper, uh, the kid Odd Future, but his comment is cyberbullying ain't real. I'm not gonna try to do the accent, but like if you experience that happening, you know what I'm saying? Just turn off the computer, you know what I'm saying? Like go play basketball. I mean, live your life. And I actually think that that is, without mocking him, he's a smart guy. But I mean, that's sort of my attitude. I like social media. I used to own a small social media brand, so I think I'm still pretty funny online. But um, when I'm on there, my goal is to engage. I post a lot. I have a pretty good idea of how the metrics work, so on down the line. Um, other than that, I don't really think there's a secret. Just don't take it too seriously. Realize it's a bunch of people on the internet. The guy you're arguing with has the profile picture of an ancient Roman statue or something. <laughs> I logged on the other day, and the debate under one of my comments was someone whose profile picture was Pepe the Frog versus someone whose profile picture was one of the pink feminist, uh, let's say, woman hats. And I just, I just ignored the whole conversation. <laughs> I moved on to the next thing. But if, if you want to be active on social media, post a lot, follow back. Try to be funny, and certainly don't take it too seriously. People will definitely go for the throat, but realize that these aren't really people. These are the Roman statue avatars of people living in a basement somewhere. <laughs> so uh, have fun with it. Uh, if any of you guys follow me on Twitter, I'll probably follow you back. And yes, I have something like 200,000 followers across social media, so hopefully I'm not just saying nonsense to them. All right. Uh, Micah has got the microphone in the back. If you've got a question for Wilfred Riley, just raise your hand, and Micah will uh, seek you out. No, no. Actually, we got better mics than you do. Go ahead. Excuse me. Good job there, Professor. Uh, question for you here. You said at point one, be aware as we consume this information from media outlets. But my question to you is, what is the case for consuming it? We know it's garbage. <laughs> if, <laughs> if every conservative or center-right person stopped watching this stuff, wouldn't it hit them in their pocketbook? Well, I think that, first of all, I think that's a great point. Um, I'm obviously not personally going to move to, say, Wyoming and live off the grid. I'm a city kid by background. I enjoy if everything from my Fox to my NBA. But yeah, to the extent that you can get original sourced material, I mean, like the actual BJS report that I described, like the actual medical journal papers describing COVID, all this is available online, and you guys strike me as at least as smart as the average TV newsreader. So yeah, there's, there's no negative uh, repercussion that I can think of of doing that whatsoever. Uh, but if you do like television, and again, CNN and Fox are on in the airport. You know, you drive to work. Like, you're, you're probably not going to get around this content. Just remember the bias toward sensationalism, the bias toward fear inducement, and very often the bias toward political liberalism. So you're, you're aware of what you're consuming. I think that's a good, simple answer. But yeah, to the extent you can consume primary sources, to the extent you're going to the local library, you're checking out journals, you're checking out first-line books, yeah, that, that's great. That's the best answer. That's especially true if you're a family with kids, by the way. I mean, the extent, the less the extent to which your kids, and I don't mean to be sexist here, but probably especially your daughters looking at the depression research, the less time people spend on TikTok, Twitter, and so on down the line, almost certainly the better. I can't imagine there's, there's an effective counter to that. Good question. I thought, okay, yeah, hand up. I, I didn't see the mic, but I'm willing to answer. <laughs> Hi, it's gr great to meet you. Um, you mentioned earlier about we should get more involved, and I purposely go to the uh, to the uh, dens of the other side, school board meetings, legal one voters. I'll go to legal one voters, and they had a uh, or the school board meetings, and I'll say, talk about white privilege, and I'll explain that that's why whites are doing so much better. And I'll say, well, what, how do you explain the Asians as far as their test scores and the lower uh, uh, suspension rates? And they just, I get blank stares. <laughs> or uh, the, new, the new Jim Crow, League of Women Voters uh, uh, meeting I went to, and I said, well, is there anybody here, well, can, can you name of one uh, African American who's in federal or state prison for selling a bag of weed? And just blank stares. So I think you're right about that, but I have one, one question I have is, okay. what's going to happen with the, uh, the Louisville case where you had a, a Black Lives Matter uh, member sh uh, a 
attempted Shoot murder. the mayor? A, a, a white Jewish mayor, there's only three possibilities. He shot him because he's white, he's Jewish, or white and Jewish, because they both agree politically. So they're, they're caught now. They almost have to... They well, have I, to I think there's a fourth possibility, which we tend to neglect in these mass shooter cases. He could have been crazy as a loon. <laughs> I mean, he thought, could have thought he was shooting the president of Mars. <laughs> I don't mean to mock a mental health situation, even this one, but I mean, like, it, I think we often downplay the chance that mental health played a major role in these cases. I mean, yeah, this is a guy who walked in. This is a remarkable case. I mean, one of BLM Louisville's best known activists, who'd previously reported for our Courier Journal major newspaper, shot the mayor, essentially. Not yet, but walked into his office and shot the most likely candidate for the Louisville mayoralty. Um, I would imagine he's going to be punished pretty seriously despite the best efforts of uh, those left-leaning individuals on the prosecution team, so on down the line. That is an attempted murder. Uh, I'm not entirely sure it was racially motivated. In terms of the comment about taking the debate to opponents, yeah, that's a great idea. I find that a lot of people just don't know things. Like I mentioned that the average person on the political left, at least, thinks that 1,000 people or more, it's up to 10,000, are unarmed when shot by the police annually. That, that kind of statistic is not uncommon. So the more you can show up and just sort of dispute that, the more you can say there's an entire group, Asian Americans, it's 8% of the country, that's smoking white and black Americans. No hate for those groups, but the harder it becomes to attribute every one of the white-black gaps to racism. So yeah, sure, the reason most people don't do that, I think, is just cowardice or laziness, and I'm guilty of both myself. Like, when I think of enjoyable things I would do on a Saturday night, I don't know if I would go to a League of Women Voters meeting <laughs> and argue with people <laughs> about systemic racism. I bet um, a lot of those people might be fun to hang out with under different circumstances, actually, but um, if, if you are doing that, that's good, and I mean, I, I think you're spreading good, useful information. Fake information, by the way, has an extraordinary range. Um, I felt I was dropping enough statistics during the talk, didn't do this one. But when I mentioned COVID-19, the average American thinks that 9% of the population has already died from COVID. That's from KEKSTC, K-E-K-S-T-C, the great European consultancy. So I mean, th there's data like this on almost every issue. Most people are extraordinarily misinformed. And in fact, that sort of upper middle class left that I was targeting during this speech, that tends to be the group that feels itself the best informed, it's often the least. So that's something, that's something to keep in mind. We got time for one more question if there's another hand. I can't really see. One more? Yeah, I see a couple hands back there. Talk about my socks. Um, I tend to wear dog socks for good luck. Uh, these are French bulldogs. I'm more a Doc's Hoon guy myself. So yeah, that's uh, socks and a tie. This is a pretty low-key tie, fairly low-key watch. But I mean, there are a few ways as a man without looking like a buffoon you can display for an event like this. So I, I usually have those three uh, kind of on point. The suits are all literally just chaps and polo suits that I buy off the rack at Kohl's. So I have like eight identical ones. I have like four grays and four blacks, as God intended. <laughs> I have a question for you. It's very timely. Um, Certainly. Here in Minnesota. Uh, I'm not sure how to best put it. What would you say to the youth of America today when a police officer is sentenced to prison for making a mistake and the individual who was shot had a criminal background and was not cooperating with police but is portrayed as the victim? I, I think my big problem there is with portrayed as the victim. Um, I, I really do think that in that case, the sentence, which was, uh, you might correct me, but uh, 16 months, eight are probably going to be served. That, that's a reasonable sentence in a manslaughter case. I, I, I do obviously lean right personally. I, I can't imagine that that's not about on par with sentences in the field. Um, I think that there were, one of the elephants in the room there was also that Minneapolis police or Minneapolis uh, St. Paul policings had some problems in recent years. And it's not just George Floyd, as I recall, and I, I don't mean to mock a great city, my host city, but I mean, that was the department that was also involved with the unfortunate shooting of an Australian tourist. By, in that case, uh, a black, a Somali-American officer. Um, there was the shooting of Philando Castile. You know, that was, I believe that was a Hispanic officer, Geronimo Yanez. 
But I mean, that was right outside the city, closest inner ring suburb. And then you have this case, and it's, it's a fleeing suspect. And I, I think, honestly, the officer, unfortunately, made the mistake of being honest when she said, I was reaching for the taser. I was going for the taser. All this is on tape. So, I mean, I can't imagine a jury looking at that after four or five of these cases in a five-year period, four-year period, wasn't a little less sympathetic than they normally might be to an officer. Um, so that's, that's the reality on the ground. I am pretty familiar with that case. Uh, do some advising for police groups, so kept up on it. I do think that the one thing that was pretty disgusting was the depiction of Dante Wright. I mean where people were saying things like, oh, what would Dante have given for just one more day with the family? And I don't, there's always this narrative of sort of a bright future lied ahead of this person, perhaps. But I mean, Dante Wright had been involved in a couple of, not that this justifies this shooting, but had been involved in a couple of brutal woman beating, robbery, so on cases. As I understand, he's the lead suspect in a case that left another black man paralyzed. Uh, there was a head shot, head wound case. So, I mean, I do think that there, there's no real reason for the media to say this person is a hero when they're describing the victim in a police shooting matter or any other fight case, as opposed to just saying, well, this was a technical violation of the law. You know, justice will be done. By the way, that would be my advice on most of these cases for media on right and left. Don't crusade. Just describe what happened and let the jury make their decision. I mean, Kyle Rittenhouse was almost sentenced to prison because of the absurd media coverage of that situation. And as the trial began to be covered live, I think a lot of people realized for the first time, oh, everyone that Rittenhouse shot was Caucasian. You know, I mean, just everyone that Rittenhouse shot was a career criminal. One of them was a convicted pedophile who told Rittenhouse, I'm going to get at you later when these two groups were clashing. So, I mean, the acquittal was not a surprise if you'd read any of the court record. If you've just watched MSNBC or whatever the network might be, it probably came as a stunner. So, I, I guess getting to the point, I absolutely agree with you. Be honest about what happens in these cases. Don't make every defendant into a hero or every victim into a hero. But I, I don't think the outcome of that case itself was wildly unjust, that particular case. Well, that's going to bring our program to a close. Let's have a nice round of applause for Wilfred Riley.